Welcome to the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. As investigators and mediators focused on regulatory and workplace conflicts, we have seen a thing or two and learned a thing or two. In each episode, we will be speaking with industry leaders in regulation, human resources and law, as well as thought leaders and top performers in investigations and mediation. We bring our audience interesting and cutting edge information on conflict management as it relates to professional regulation and workplace disputes. This industry is one of many views and we have to say that some views shared by our guests are not necessarily shared by the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast, its host or sponsors. Today's show is brought to you by Bernard and Associates, trusted investigation and mediation professionals since 2004. Now here's your host, Dean Bernard. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the podcast, and thank you for listening. Today's guest is a woman that I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with for many years, Rebecca Durkin, partner at the law firm Stonica Macura LeBlanc. Now, we're going to discuss the issue of how regulators deal with off-duty conduct of those they regulate. But before we get into all of that, I want to give Rebecca a proper introduction. So with that, let me just tell you a little about her. Rebecca was a bencher of the Law Society of Ontario from 2018 to 2019. She attended Queen's University to study history and obtained her law degree from the University of Windsor in 2000. In 2006, Rebecca completed her master's in health law from Osgoode Hall. And in 2016, she obtained her risk management certificate from the University of Toronto. Now, Rebecca acts as general counsel, prosecution counsel, and independent legal counsel to several Ontario regulators. She co-authored the Annotated Statutory Powers Procedure Act with her partner, Julie Makura in 2016, and recently wrote another text on professional regulation that is published by Iman Publishing. Rebecca regularly speaks about regulatory issues at various national and international regulatory conferences and provides regulatory updates via her firm's publication, Gray Areas, and its regulatory blog. Now, there's a wealth of things that we can learn from Rebecca today, but one caveat that we have to keep in mind is that her comments and thoughts today are, are not legal advice, rather just her sharing knowledge so we all can learn a little something. And so with that being said, welcome to the show, Rebecca. Hello, Dean. Thank you so much for having me. Now, it's great to have you here. And I've been interviewing a lot of different people for this podcast, and we're really excited to have you on the show. And when I thought of you, I immediately thought of of one of the issues that's sort of a bit of a challenging issue, I think, for some regulators to deal with. And that is this issue of of dealing with off-duty conduct. And I think it's important to clear up what we really mean by that and why this is something regulators are concerned with. So I'm hoping maybe we could start with you just enlightening us a little bit about that. Sure. And the question in and of itself is actually really uh, a good question to ask because what was once considered off-duty conduct Um, or was perhaps better phrase, what was once not considered off-duty conduct and uh, and arguably irrelevant to whether or not a professional could practice or not, has really evolved over time. And what was once considered irrelevant is now considered relevant. What was once considered conduct that was completely irrelevant to a member's ability to practice has, the conduct is now actually becoming much more pressing. And in certain situations, it's actually the inverse has occurred. Conduct that would once have been considered very consequential and concerning is now no longer. So that's my long-winded way of saying uh, off-duty conduct, in a general sense, conduct that occurs when a professional is not wearing their hat, when it occurs outside of the clinic, outside of the law firm, outside of the practice, usually historically considered personal or private conduct. And as I said, traditionally, this has been considered to be uh, not relevant to the public or to the regulator. You know, several uh, years ago, whether a professional had a criminal conviction or had some other legal issue arise that was not arguably relevant to the practice was not followed up by a regulator. And that's changed. I think there's been a recognition that it's very hard to divorce the personal from the professional, that depending on the profession and depending on the conduct, that really can become intertwined, especially when the public perceives that individual professional or the profession writ large. 
So it's really been an expanding area. It's really um, evolving. It is changing. And uh, as we'll discuss, context will, will very often be key. Right. And, and, you know, it's interesting too, because off-duty conduct that can be a concern to a regulator doesn't necessarily have to be something that's considered illegal. I often think, you know, I'm a registrant uh, of a profession and I choose to do something that's generally considered, you know, a legal thing to do. It's, I haven't broken a law, but for some reason, the regulator has to get involved when they learn of this conduct. And uh, I'm sort of curious, you know, why should a regulator be able to tell me that I can't do something that everybody else can do? Great question. So the short answer is that there is sort of a quid pro quo when you agree and usually seek out to become a member of a regulated profession. The benefit is that you usually would get, uh, let's say, a protected title, or you would get a protected scope of practice, or you get to do certain things that are not in the public domain. And what usually flows from that is prestige, privilege, a higher income, because you're able to demand more for acts that are not considered within the public domain. So those are sort of the perks of being a regulated professional. But the responsibilities um, are several. One of those responsibilities is sometimes acknowledging and acquiescing that because you are a regulated professional, because you uh, hold a position within society that is argued to be a privileged position, you will agree to follow the rules of the regulator. You will sometimes agree to do things that are within the public domain that you yourself will not do. So it's a bit of a contractual agreement between a professional and their regulator. But you know, sometimes that can be challenged. The, the most recent example was the case of Nurse Strong out in Saskatchewan. And um, while off duty, this nurse really uh, vocally and through her social media criticized the nursing care that was being provided to a family member. Her regulator took issue with this and brought Nurse Strong to the discipline committee and a finding of professional misconduct was made. Um, so this was a situation where she was not practicing, but the comments that anyone is entitled to make. Her regulator said, no, as a nurse, you cannot make those comments. As a nurse, you are bringing a level of scrutiny and disrepute to the, to the profession. And after a somewhat long and torturous winding through the courts, Nurse Strom was successful in pushing back against her regulator. And it was determined that, yes, uh, there, there may be situations where a regulator can uh, circumscribe what and how a regulated professional can say, but this wasn't that case, that Nurse Strom's comments did not rise to the level of professional misconduct. So regulators sometimes may arguably overreach in their ability or desire to maintain that level of professionalism, but this is a constantly evolving area. Absolutely. And really, I can imagine it puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the regulators in the sense because they're, they're the ones making that judgment call. And it's really kind of an interesting dynamic because you've got people out there every day that are registered professionals in whatever profession they do who are making a judgment call on what their behavior or off-duty conduct will be. And then you have the regulator also making that judgment. And when those two judgments don't align, then boom, we have a problem. And I guess that's one of the real challenges here. And, and I assume then that obviously these are sort of a case by case kind of thing. Regulators must have to consider individual circumstances, I assume. So important. And just to pick up what you said earlier, sometimes regulators are in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. You know, regulators are there by mandate, by statute to serve and protect the public interest. So they know that is their goal. They know that is their job. And so as long as they're acting in good faith, when they bring these challenges, when they bring these allegations against certain members or registrants, that's the lens through which they're viewing the conduct of really serving and protecting the public interest. Obviously, they have to be fair to the member. But when you consider that they're told that they have to serve and protect the public interest, and then sometimes when they do so, they're slapped back by the court saying, no, no, you've overreached. So you can see how there is a bit of a tension within a regulator's discretion as to, you know, how far should we push? Where is that point where we're pushing too much? And that is continually a struggle. That's continually a tension that is within the regulator's sort of bandwidth. But I really, really want to drive home that last point you made of context. Context is so key. What may amount 
to conduct in someone's personal life that does rise to the level of professional misconduct may not in another. It might be the individual facts in that case. It may be the individual profession. It may be the uh, timing of the conduct. So for example, there was a, a relatively recent case here in Ontario and a police officer had gone to a conference basically supporting the elimination of, of any sort of criminal consequences to possession of cannabis. And when this gentleman's employer found out, allegations were brought forth and he was found to have engaged in conduct while off duty that um, rose to the level of professional misconduct, that his comments, because he was a police officer, she, she shouldn't have made such comments. He shouldn't have made them in public, even though he was not on duty at the time. And the courts have sort of said no. The appellate body realized that by the time this hearing had winded its way to them, cannabis had in fact possession had been taken out of the criminal code, that the, the timing, that the, the, the public's view on the issue of possession of cannabis had dramatically shifted. So it would be difficult to qualify this as conduct that would be considered unbecoming. It would be difficult to say that this police officer's comments had damaged the reputation of the profession in the eyes of the public. So that's an example where you can see that the conduct at play 20, 30 years ago, it might've been a slam dunk case, but there has been an evolution in that view of, the, of that conduct, that that is now considered to be completely acceptable and would not bring that profession into disrepute. So that's an example of, of facts, really specific facts. Another case out, out East in the Maritimes was a lawyer who had been uh, found to have engaged in conduct unbecoming because he had been um, arrested for spousal abuse. And when the facts came to light, it was quite clear he had readily cooperated with the police, that he actually had been assaulted by his partner and not vice versa. So those individual factors really made it clear that being arrested for, yes, a heinous crime, but when the actual details were reviewed, it was very difficult for the law society to claim that the public would view the profession in a less than ideal light because he simply had been charged. So often the individual factors are really going to matter. With that being said, I do think there has been a much more ready acceptance by regulators that a professional is not just, you know, a professional by day and a regular person by night, that it is sometimes depending on the allegation, whether it's legal conduct or simply unprofessional or unbecoming conduct, that it's really sometimes hard to divorce the two. And that it really is a regulator's role to regulate, to effectively regulate and ensure that their members do demonstrate the conduct that is expected of a professional. And remember, it's not just in the disciplinary realm. It's also at the front end. It's also when people wish to become a professional, when they wish to enter and join the regulator, they will have to prove their good character. They will have to prove their requisite level of integrity to join a professional regulator. So it's conduct that they, um, as I said, 20, 30 years ago, a blind eye might have occurred over certain conduct, but that has changed. I think that the public is expecting more of its professionals. Right. And it's interesting because the other issue with all of this is, and a couple of your examples, or at least one of your examples speaks to this, but the issue of social media, where, you know, we're seeing more and more, like the volume of, of matters that regulators have to deal with is rising. <laughs> Some of the reason for that is social media, because this is where a lot of professionals do get themselves into hot water. And social media is, it's like anything else. It's just another source of information. And with so much information out there, there's no shortage of issues being brought to the attention of regulators. Definitely. And you're right. Social media is also this very, very large, very, very accessible magnifying glass. What, you know, conduct that might have occurred in the past might not have risen to the level of the regulator's radar simply because it was occurring within the four walls of a professional's um, home or, you know, not just the, this self-posting on social media. It's the ability, of course, we all have these mini video recorders in our pockets and conduct that, again, might have gone unnoticed can now be recorded and now be sent to regulators. So the availability of information is so much greater now than I would say even 10 years ago. And you probably know that better than anyone. 
Absolutely. In fact, I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day. We were talking about the availability of cameras and recorders and the ability to post this information. And what would life have been like for us 20, 30 years ago when this stuff didn't exist, if it had then? And uh, my comment was, I'm just glad it didn't exist then. <laughs> Because uh, all of us have our moments, right? People have moments of, of weakness, moments where they their judgment isn't necessarily the best judgment. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make them bad people. But as you said earlier, there's a level of accountability that must be there for people. They're held to, I know it's a bit of a cliche, but they're held to a higher standard and they have to be able to uh, project that standard. And so speaking of standards, or, you know, I guess another way to look at it is guidelines. Is there something regulators could be doing to perhaps create a set of, you know, or maybe some have, if they created a set of standards or guidelines to help guide their registrants in understanding off-duty conduct and the things they should be doing to protect themselves? I have seen a real uptake in regulators doing just that, whether it's through their newsletter, whether it's through guidelines, whether through it's a policy of really reminding professionals that their off-duty conduct matters. I've also seen an uptick in reminding of registrants and members of social media and what is considered to be professional and what is considered not to be professional, what would be acceptable to that regulator and what would not. So I am seeing regulators reach out and provide that assistance to their members so that their members are quite aware of that very fuzzy line that it does exist. But also, of course, that also serves as a reminder to the public and to the patients and clients of these regulated professionals. So the, these policies guidelines would be posted on the regulator's website. So it serves two purposes. One, it really reminds members of what is expected of them. And two, it really informs and educates the public. And as I said, individual patients and clients of what they can expect of their massage therapist or naturopath or lawyer or paralegal. So I am seeing regulators do a much more active reach out on this issue. That's great to see. I mean, I've, I've seen that as well. And, and uh, it's good to see that it's happening now. This has been really informative, Rebecca, and I, we try to keep these episodes relatively short so people can kind of get some good information and move on. But one thing I like to do on every episode of the podcast is have our guests share a little bit about their off work interests. Or what do you do when you're not helping your clients? So I'll start off by saying I'm the luckiest lawyer in the world because I do really interesting work, public interest based and have the best clients, people who really are there to help. So as I said, I, I'm very lucky that as a lawyer, I, I have such a fulfilling role, but when I am not doing um, the world's best job, I am running around after my three gorgeous sons. So I have three boys who keep me very, very busy and be because I need to stay in shape to keep up with them. I am, especially since the pandemic started, a very committed runner. So I would have called myself a non-committed runner before the pandemic. But since the pandemic has hit, I run uh, religiously six days a week uh, in my early morning runs. That gives me my, so this is my cardio, my mental therapy all rolled into one. And yeah, it's, it's not the most exciting off-duty conduct, but it's all I have time for right now. And it's incredibly fulfilling. We all have our ways of, of dealing. I mean, obviously your job is stressful and, you know, you said how lucky you are to have the clients you have, but having worked with you for so many years, I have to say they're, they're pretty lucky to have you too. So uh, <laughs> that's definitely a given. You know what, Rebecca, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest on the show. I know you're busy. and I know that our listeners are going to say how informative this was and how useful your comments were. And you shared some really good insights. And it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Now, some people will want to connect with you on this or maybe some other issue. What's the best way they can reach you? The best way to reach me is probably through our website. Our website is sml law.com. And my email address is easily accessible through that. And I also am a big believer and big user on Twitter, where I often tweet out lots of information on professional regulations. So um, I'm at Dirk and Rebecca is my Twitter handle. So those are the best two places to find me. Excellent. Well, thanks so much. And everybody, that's the show for today. Thanks again for listening. And as I say with every episode, please send us your comments, your suggestions. Our goal with this podcast and with, frankly, everything we do 
is constant and never ending improvement. And your feedback really helps us with that. So we can bring you interesting and helpful content with each new episode that we're producing. So all of the podcasts do get linked to our website, benardink.com. You can always reach me at dbenard at benardink.com or Dean Bernard on LinkedIn. Now, thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next time on the We've Seen a Thing or Two podcast. Bye-bye, everybody.